everyone. Um, thank you to everyone for joining us for tonight's panel discussion of Beyond Marriage Equality, um, exactly one year on from the announcement of Australia's Marriage Equality Postal Survey. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge that we're meeting today on the traditional lands of the Kulin Nation and pay my deepest respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, I'd also like to pay my respects to the elders of other communities who may be with us today, with a particular mention to any um, elders from the LGBTIQ plus community who um, remember an Australia where they were treated like criminals and whose fearless strength has paved the way for all of us to live in the country and the communities that we live in today. So... I think I should start by introducing our wonderful panellists for the evening. Um, my name is Lee Carney. I'm a senior LGBTI rights lawyer at the Human Rights Law Centre. And I've been joined by three amazing people that I've been honoured to work with over the last year. Um, on the end, we have Wilhelmina Strack, who's the Assistant Secretary of the Victorian Trades Hall Council. Will has a long history of community organising and was the mind, heart and soul of last year's Victorian Yes Equality campaign. Um, in terms of organising all of the volunteers and the organisers and the activists and the incredible public on the ground community presence um, during the postal survey. We also have Aram Hosey, who's next along. Aram is the Executive of Public Affairs at CoHealth and a nationally renowned LGBTI rights advocate. Um, Aram's work is focused on advancing the health and rights of transgender people, um, including media advocacy, playing an instrumental role in the reform of passports and Medicare policy, um, winning a High Court challenge to Western Australia's gender recognition laws, and advocating on HIV issues internationally. And finally, but not um, but not least by any means, I don't even know if that makes sense, but uh, we have Timothy Jones. Um, Tim is a historian of Gender, Sexuality and Religion. He is the lead author and researcher on the Preventing Harm, Promoting Justice, Responding to LGBT Conversion Therapy in Australia report that was released just a few weeks ago. Um, Timothy also teaches at La Trobe University and is the Vice President of the Australian Lesbian and Gay Archives. Can you please join me in welcoming tonight's panelists? Okay, so one year ago, there were so many um, hugs and tears and screams and dancing and there was a lot of glitter in the streets very close to us, just at the State Library. Um, let's start by reflecting on what a year it's been and what that process was like. How does it feel to be one year on? I think I'm relieved. Yeah, I was going to say the same it thing. It was a terrible, terrible thing and I think I'm just relieved, mm. yeah. So what was your emotion when you were outside at the State Library? Yes, I was at the State Library. And how did it feel when the, uh, you know, the statistician, the Australian statistician finally said, well, 61.6% .6 of Australians voted yes for marriage equality? I was really happy that the number had a six in front of it. That was really important to me. Um, I sobbed, sobbed, racking sobs. And you may remember there was a lot of... Um, plain tree pollen in the air. So then I had an asthma attack, <laughs> it was massive, and then I collapsed on the ground and couldn't breathe, and then I had to get up and talk at the State Library. So it was a roller coaster ride of health and other issues. <laughs> and do you remember what you said on stage? Not really, no. Um, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure it was pretty awesome. <laughs> Indeed. And how about you two? How did you celebrate the Yes Victory or reflect on it or hear about it? We should not do an order thing. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, I watched it on TV uh, and my sister joined me from Perth on FaceTime, so we watched it together oh. digitally. That was really cute. Uh, it was Palestine National Day, so I went to that and by the time I left that, all the gay parties were full and I couldn't get into any. Uh, <laughs> so I had some beers with some friends at a not gay party which was still pretty gay. <laughs> uh, so I was uh, also at the uh, the same place that Will was. And, yeah, I think the, the sense was very much relief as mm. well. It was less kind of celebratory and more mm. fuel, I think. Um, and it wasn't until much later in the day that there was a sense of, now maybe we can celebrate. Uh, so I think probably this time last year I was maybe in a line hoping to get into the street party yeah. uh, and then probably spent a fair bit of the night in some other lines trying to get into other parties. And I think that um, actually demonstrated how 
relieved people were and how much people wanted to celebrate after what had been a really super tough time. So uh, I did get into a party and then stayed there to the wee hours. And I want to go back to what you've mentioned, Aram, about super tough times and reflecting back on the postal survey process and particularly the parts of our community that were particularly targeted by the No campaign that really bore the brunt of the vitriol um, and what that has meant for the last 12 months in terms of recovering and rebuilding some of that strength and resilience. Yeah, I think there's good recognition that uh, transgender diverse people really were at the forefront of copying the brunt of a lot of the, some of the worst and, and most vitriolic and horrible things to come out of that. And that's historically often been the case, actually. You know, sometimes that untold story about Stonewall is that it was, it was trans women and, and gender diverse people who were at the front literally throwing their shoes to get things started because uh, they were sick of constantly being um, you know, assaulted and harassed. And so trans people are often the, are often kind of at the front lines and that was certainly the case during the survey. Um, and it was difficult because in the broader debate there wasn't a lot of kind of fighting back for some good, sensible, strategic reasons, but it meant that I think the people really felt attacked and unable to pro um, protect themselves and defend themselves. And so those wounds kind of continue, I think. 12 months later, we're still in a place of people still feeling pretty beaten up and hurt by that and feeling like there's a lot of work to be done for trans and gender diverse people and hoping that um, having been through that for same-sex marriage, for marriage equality, that um, hoping allies will have the backs of trans and gender diverse people now who continue to be under attack, as we see in safe schools and the religious exemption stuff, like, it continues to be frontline. And Will, you would have had some experience during the postal survey period as well with all of your volunteers who were on the ground, who were knocking on doors and making phone calls and talking to family members. What was it like, you know, hearing those responses of them, you know, also facing some of those attacks and, you know, not being sure how to deal with it? How would you... Address I that. think people were remarkably resilient. Mm. The people who came and did things with us were remarkably resilient. Um, and overwhelmingly the experiences were pretty positive. But I think the heart... I, I actually think talking to strangers about this stuff was probably easier. Door knocking actually was an easier thing. I think the hard thing was for people... Because, you know, it was that thing about let's start with your community, your friends, your family. I reckon the hardest experiences were people who asked their family how they were voting and got the no. And I think... So I actually... And, you know, I, 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 and that's why for me... I, I would say the postal survey was a crap experience for me, but overwhelmingly I knew that my family and friends... Like, it was, there was never a moment's doubt that they were all yes and they were going to do things for yes and they were going to do whatever. So for, I didn't have that. But I had friends and I knew volunteers who had that conversation because we asked them to, a conversation that they had never had necessarily, a conversation that, you know, when you have Christmas, everybody go, goes around, no one ever confronts. And they had the conversation and it did not go the way that they hoped and they had to... They had to work through what that might, what that meant for them and for that person as well. And I see you nodding along, Tim. Most of your research has been in the intersection between LGBTIQ communities and faith communities. So I imagine this is something that you'd see a lot in your work. Do you have any comments about, you know, that opposition that's always, you know, put forward in the media and by politicians that, you know, you're either LGBTIQ plus or you're religious and religious communities don't support the LGBTIQ plus community and, you know, how to problematise that and see it in a more nuanced way? Yeah, um, I think that, that false opposition that there's religious people and LGBT people and they're separate, discrete groups. What about LGBT people of faith? Um, what about religious people who support queer rights? Um, and the complexities of that were really uh, hidden, I think, uh, in the polarisation of the debate last year. And I think it takes uh, critical thinking and it takes good journalism not to just to go for the, the easy oppositions, the false oppositions that make easy copy, um, but actually the complexities of people's experiences of dealing with family, um, dealing with friends, working out their own faith. And I think what's happened after the, 
the campaign, which I think is really interesting. I mean, you might have noticed that the No campaign didn't make religious arguments against marriage equality. It tried to make secular sounding uh, arguments, but it's pretty, pretty much fueled by religious sentiment. Um, but what has happened, and I think this is really exciting, um, although the, the campaign was traumatic and really difficult for queer people to deal with, um, it has brought religion out into the public in a way that it has never been before in Australian political discourse. And we're now having a discussion of what role religion should play in public life, uh, what powers of discrimination, what exemptions from the law should we give uh, religious organisations and individuals. And I think that's a really healthy discussion for society to be having. Um, uh, popping the, the Trojan horse of all of those secular sounding arguments that um, not that you can pop a horse. That was a really bad <laughs> snake <laughs> metaphor. <laughs> I like it though. <laughs> to wheel a horse? Is that what you do with a Trojan horse? I feel like they had to drag it into the city or... You've got to gut it. Um, well, that's a, a great place to kick off, I think. So moving beyond marriage equality then, um, we've been hearing a lot about the Religious Freedom Review, um, not the full report, of course, just leaked segments of it. Um, and we've also been hearing a lot about um, discrimination in religious schools against both students and teachers. And I know that at Trades Hall, you've been doing a lot of work about the rights of LGBTIQ plus workers. Um, what's your position on these exemptions from discrimination laws, which allow religious schools to make hiring and firing decisions against teachers and staff? We don't support that. Our, I mean, there are some jobs, obviously, where if it's an inherent requirement of the job that you have a particular, um, you adhere to a particular religion or you have a particular experience in a particular religion, sure, that's fine. If you teach RE at a Catholic school, yeah, by all means, ask that that person be a Catholic. Um, I don't know that the same applies to the cleaner. I certainly don't think it applies to the maths teacher. I don't think a maths teacher has to adhere to a particular um, religion in order to be able to teach maths. Uh, and it's our position that therefore those dis th that exemption from um, anti-discrimination provisions shouldn't apply. Um, and I think that as part of these debates, we've been talking about teachers and yep. staff, but we've also been talking about students. And um, the new Prime Minister, different from the one we had this time last year, um, has made comments about uh, gender whisperers in schools and particularly made some comments about trans and gender diverse students in schools. And it can feel like it's the same arguments over and over again. Um, what are your thoughts on those comments and what that says about what the trans and gender diverse community is going to be facing over the coming six months leading up to a potential election, Aaron? Uh, well, I suppose I have to look at the US and think the US is a bit of a canary for us sometimes. So the general direction of travel in the US is pretty terrifying um, between what they try and do with bathroom bills sometimes. Um, I think Trump's kind of brain fart bubble thought about just making it impossible to essentially change your documentation, trying to erase trans people. Um, I think like all of the progressive issues, we should never assume that a fight is won. And I think certainly what we've seen in other parts of the world is that often as um, gay and lesbian people get more rights, the, sh the fight then kind of shifts to trans people. I mean, I was reflecting on when I did some of that advocacy you were talking about, um, it tended to be fly under the radar quite a lot, actually. You know, kind of progressing some of those those issues for trans people was a little easier because it didn't run into some serious opposition, whereas now it's a specific, like, well, trans people are a specific target mm -hmm. and trans young people in particular are coming in for real attack, which is deeply disturbing mm -hmm. given the vulnerability of young people um, who, are, who are at that stage in their life. So it's, uh, it's concerning. I mean, we can fight back and we can, we can take it on, but it's yeah. pretty concerning that we have to. I'm actually a bit more optimistic than, than you, Aaron. Um, That's good. That's good. Tell uh, me. <laughs> well, I've just been noticing what the, the change in the way in which uh, values are being talked about in Australia after the, the survey, where the majority of Australians came out and said, no, LGBT people are fully human. They, f they have the dignity of humans. They deserve the joy and the misery of marriage as much as anybody else. Um, uh, and actually, the language about how children have been talked about in this uh, in, in this 
debate about discrimination has changed as well. The Christian right, I'm writing a book about the Christian right um, and its involvement in Australian sexual politics. Um, the Christian right used the language of family values and children's rights to kind of get people on board with their views. But now that the majority of Australian people um, recognise and have affirmed that LGBT people are fully human, in this debate about um, excluding children from schools, the LGBT child is being recognised and protected by the majority of Australians. I think that's really changed, and I'm not sure how successfully those American politics, which and America has very different demographics, religious demographics, especially to Australia. I don't know how successful uh, conservatives in Australia will be at translating those uh, anti-trans politics to Australia. I'm optimistic. I'm, some, I'm naively optimistic about it, perhaps. But that's I'll right. like take advantage to... of that quite happily. That's fine. Mm. Right. <laughs> Um, and you've been researching as well, Tim, um, what's been happening within faith communities recently and you've released this report on conversion therapy. Um, is it a similar issue where, you know, faith communities started looking at LGB people and now they're focusing more on the trans community? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, Lee was one of the authors, authors of the report, so um, <laughs> that was a bit of an in, in disingenuous question. Um, <laughs> Uh, yes, so uh, when mainstream psychiatry in the early 70s decided that um, LGBT people didn't suffer illnesses and were just normal humans, uh, gay liberation came, there was a reaction within religious communities to try and turn LGBT people straight and cisgendered and there was a variety of different attempts uh, over the last 50 years that have been operating quite consistently in conservative religious communities, communities of all faiths. Um, but we did notice doing the research that since the 90s and especially uh, since the 2000s, trans people have been particularly prominent in the way that religious communities uh, have been targeted by religious communities to try and um, become cis again. Um, and so let's start talking about, you know, we're talking about the attacks on trans communities, but let's start talking about what trans and gender diverse communities in Australia want now, post-marriage equality. What are their key demands? What should everyone in this room go away and start talking to their friends about? Uh, it, it'd, be, um, it'd be reasonable for people to think that the LGBT communities cared very much about pieces of paper. If I think about the um, a marriage equality was about being able to get a marriage certificate and for trans and gender diverse people being able to get uh, legal recognition in terms of your birth certificate and your other documentation is one of the key challenges that still exists. Um, for kind of the same reasons that a marriage certificate matters really around that recognition, that validation, um, that that relationship is a as, as valid as anyone else's relationship and similarly for a trans or gender diverse person that your identity is as valid and real and you as anybody else's. So that's a really key one. Um, there's a patchwork of laws around the country. In some states, they're better than in other places. Um, it should be consistent everywhere and it should be not crap everywhere would ideally be what we'd be aiming for. Um, but then there's also a range of other issues for trans people. The situation in terms of access to healthcare is really not improving for trans people and I don't think we should accept that. Um, and in fact, in many cases, things are becoming more expensive and more difficult. Uh, so health and legal recognition are the two big issues. Um, discrimination protection can be a little patchy as well. I come from Western Australia originally. There's the protections there are very poor and, and urgently need to be overhauled. So those kinds of issues are really significant for trans and gender diverse folks. Um, and then of course intersex communities have a range of concerns as well. Um, that's not the community that I speak for, but I know that certainly my colleagues there, for them, uh, issues of bodily autonomy and, and forced kind of surgeries are really significant. And again, it feels kind of barbaric that we would be having conversations about forced surgeries on people, but that's the reality for, for many of those folks. Yeah. And often for the LGBTIQ plus communities, there is this intersection between what the law does and how the law discriminates and the health and mental health of the community. Um, and I think a really clear um, way of looking at that is looking at how discrimination in some areas of life have an impact and roll on effect with others. So you've been looking, Will, um, in your work about um, employment discrimination and then the impacts of that. Could you share some of those findings with the well, audience? Well, it's <laughs> It's interesting you say because we, we talk about laws and those things. Laws are a great step, but they're only as good as your capacity to um, enforce them, your confidence to enforce them and the willingness of 
institutions that are required to to help you to get that done. So there are laws that say we shouldn't discriminate in workplaces, but we know that um, around 40% of LGBTIQ people aren't out at work because they don't feel confident or comfortable that um, they're going to be safe in that space. Um, so the work we're doing, we're doing this process uh, there's been work done about changing the culture at workplaces because culture is a big factor, yeah? Um, but most often that work involves sending the executive team off to do diversity training for a day and then they come back. As trade unions, what we do most is work with people on the factory floor or on the kind of, you know, at the front counter or whatever it is. And our experience is that that work doesn't permeate down to their experience of what it is to be in a workplace, the culture of the workplace, the discrimination they experience, what they see, the homophobia, biphobia, transphobia that they see um, or that they experience. So for us, the kind of focus is how can we do more work that is about changing not just rights in workplaces, that's part of it, is about how do we bargain for and create better workplaces and rights, but then also how do we change culture, how do we create a supportive and inclusive culture, how do we work with employers on that, how do we work with workers on that, how do we do that. So that's really been our kind of primary focus since in the last 12 months. Well, I'm just going to pose that question straight back at the panel, is how do we change hearts and minds? So what have we learnt from the marriage equality campaign about how we change how people feel about a particular issue and about the LGBTIQ plus community? And how do we create that change, you know, in employment, in faith communities, towards trans and gender diverse people? I mean, that's the big question that we're all facing. So how do we do it? It's... It's an interesting thing because this is the moment, right, where you go, well, on the one hand, what we want to do is storm the barricades. What you want to do is go full or frontal. You want to challenge when you see it. You want to call it out. You want to say to somebody, that's a transphobic thing to say and you shouldn't be saying it. On the other hand, all of the evidence tells us that people don't change their behaviours because they're told that they're a shithead. Um, and that that's not how we bring people along in a process. So how do we balance out the quite natural desire that we have to kind of um, vent the frustration that we have at the way the world is? Uh, how do you balance that out with, you know, all that stuff which is about you want to bring people along, you've got to have conversations with them, you've got to... Empathy is the greatest gift that you bring to these things. There's an enormous amount of campaigning evidence out there that says that they did a they did door knocking in the US about trans issues and they have found that they can change the way that people see and the way that they understand those issues from being diametrically opposed to the, you know, the idea of trans existence even to understanding kind of the humanity. Um, but that empathy is the key. And so that would be, it's an interesting campaign question. How do we do that whilst at the same time not letting people get away with what is at times just shit behaviour? And so, I mean, you spoke about the importance of visibility and getting yep. out there and speaking to people. What are your thoughts on that, Aaron? Yeah, I think visibility is incredibly important. I mean, when I think back through the gay rights movement, there was a you know, there's a clear progression from um, folks coming out. And initially it was just a couple of very brave souls coming out and who often um, suffered some pretty severe consequences for that. But over time, more people came out, uh, there was visibility, people, it stopped being this abstract concept of this thing called apparently a gay person and started being your neighbour or a colleague. Um, and I think we're way behind that in terms of trans and gender diverse and intersex visibility. So it's still very conceptual for, for lots of people and often that concept's a bit weird or a bit scary or a bit something. So um, I'm really interested to see how we can, can really increase visibility. Um, We've got some celebrity visibility in the US, but that's that's kind of not, not always helpful, though. Not always <laughs> helpful. Sometimes helpful. Like kind of, it's yeah, it's not it's not the same as knowing that your your coworker yeah. or your your, your friend neighbor is. or your 
your cousin or whatever. Yeah. That's a different. It's a different. Yeah, I agree with that. So how? And of course, the tricky thing is that as a trans person, once you've come out, you are you are out, and that's that. You can't ever kind of go back in. Or <laughs> I wasn't really trans. I was just yeah. joking. <laughs> like, kind of. Um, so there can be a real cost for people in in doing that, and so that can be tricky. So there's there's some interest. I mm, I find some yeah. interesting questions there around. We should absolutely respect people if they if they don't want to be out and talk about it. Um, but how can we also support and encourage people to be visible? And then how can we take that visibility kind of up a up an increasing level? That's so interesting because that's ex you're quite right. That's exactly the debate that happened around outing for gay and lesbian people early in that process for that the liberation movement around what choice do people have and what response, what's the choice element, what's the responsibility element? Yeah, this, I read a really beautiful thing a few years ago which has stuck with me um, about how to support queer people in minority communities and, and this was particularly about queer people in Muslim communities um, where it might not always be very safe to come out yeah. into your, you know, your mosque and your family and your relatives uh, and they inverted it uh, and they were like, rather than feeling an imperative to come out, when it's safe and good, let people into your life, let people know you, um, which is quite a really nice way of, it's, it changes the relationship, it's like a generosity. I trust you enough to let you get to know me and have your responses. Scary though. Yeah, totally. <laughs> it is scary. Well, and, and even like, so yeah. I've just recently acquired this little badge that just says trans. And I think because of the way I present, it's very, I've been experimenting wearing it in different places. And it's fascinating seeing people go, I don't really understand what's going on here. What is that badge? Who are you? I don't, like, yeah. nobody ever engages in a conversation about it. I just see lots of kind of confused double takes and then wandering off. Like, it's, it's yeah, it's interesting about how you move people's perceptions if you're not going to have those quite intimate conversations. Um, it was interesting, actually, some research that's been done recently on public harassment and during the postal survey as well about people's experiences and getting down into, you know, why was it, um, if you were having a negative experience, why was it a negative experience? And some of them would say, well, there were over, you know, there were posters in the street, there were social media posts, there were unpleasant experiences, but a lot of people also spoke about those um, smaller acts, you know, being stared at for wearing a, a rainbow or having someone make a comment that they you know, wouldn't have thought they would have made that kind of comment in the workplace before the postal survey period. So I think it's just really interesting to highlight all of how that just plays such a big part. And I'm going to abuse my role as moderator to tell a story as well about the importance of visibility. Um, so when I came out to my mum, my mum's Malaysian Chinese, she grew up in a country where homosexuality is still a crime today. Um, and she really struggled, I think, with the idea that I could be successful after I'd told her, you know, that I'm one of the homosexuals. And she, um, but then she found out that Penny Wong was a lesbian and all of a sudden she was like, you'll be okay. <laughs> Um, so let's have a chat about, so how much has actually changed in the last year? I just interrupted my flow with the story, but how much has changed in the last year? If we're talking about moving beyond marriage equality, what positive changes have there been? How much progress have we been able to get on other issues? Do you feel like people think the job is now done? I don't think anybody thinks the job's done, do they? I don't think we even thought that at the time. Mm. Um, uh, well, um, so what's changed? On a personal level, I got married. Totes awesome. Woo! Yeah. Woo, yeah. <laughs> um, I think that uh, the one thing I drew from the whole thing was that whenever, you know, it, I was there the day that the bill passed. I was in Parliament and, you know, Bob Catter, just two words you don't like to say often, do you? Um, when he started, when they started trying to move all those amendments and he was speaking, you could feel if we were all quite tense, right? How is this going to go? What's going to happen? Are we going to get, have we come all of this way and just at the last minute, you know, crocodiles and something else is going to waylay us? And then as amendment after amendment was defeated and he spoke, this amazing thing happened where all of us just started to laugh at him because every time he spoke, it was like, this is not going to happen for you. Like, the dynamic has shifted and the sense of power and authority that you have when you talk about the silent majority and that stuff, those words don't mean what you think they mean. Because mm -hmm. the silent majority 
is our people, not your people. They are the – that's the majority. And I, that's the one thing I think that I drew from the whole process is that that dynamic now, no one now – I think they still believe it, but I think that in that middle area and in the media and just generally among our community, I don't think people – when people say that's our majority, I don't think people believe anymore – that it's got the power um, and that it's as large and frightening as we've always wondered. Mm. And I think the, you know, 61.6% that was announced this time um, last year, like, really showed that strong support for marriage equality. Um, but do you think that the same level of support would be found for the issues that we're talking about tonight when we're talking about birth certificates or conversion therapy or stronger employment protections? Like, do we think that it was just because it was that issue of marriage equality? And do you think that the kind of the narrow focus of the marriage equality debate mean that potentially people aren't aware of some of the other issues that the LGBTIQ plus community faces? I think it depends on the issue. I mean, there was a survey, wasn't there, around the discrimination against students, I think, and those figures looked quite good. It was 70-something percent, I think, of people said, no, it's not okay to discriminate against LGBT students. So I think um, I think there is some, to, to your point, I think there is some support that is is out there, but I think it does depend a little bit on the issue. Um, and we've seen that sometimes, yeah. I mean, trans people and bathrooms seems to be the place where people get most wound up sometimes in really bizarre ways. So I think it depends a little bit on the issue. Sometimes when you bring children into the picture, people can go one of two ways, either be really supportive or extraordinarily cautious. So uh, it depends, I think. I think it's also that people aren't... It, people aren't that simple. They're not against or for. It's also how it's framed, mm -hmm. who's impacted, how you talk about the issue. Everyone is a mix of, like, um, everyone should be treated equally and, uh, you know, at the same time, I'm not 100% sure about that thing. Everyone is a mix of those things. And so... I don't know that it's as simple as going they're either with us or against us and that means that 64% of Victorians are with us and whatever. I think it's that – so I think probably – I think there's work we need to do definitely in the trans yeah, space. Yeah, and, and I think – I mean, we had a 15-year campaign which yes. was very clearly singularly focused on marriage and it got people to think about it over that time and come to the view that LGBT people are human. Um <laughs> basically. Uh, but other issues that they haven't thought about, yeah. their instincts might um, be, you know, fragile and insecure. And I think other issues will take, maybe hopefully not as much work. I, hopefully we can capitalise on the sentiment of, of the, the value that we have in public life now and in, and in the vast majority of Australians to, hopefully it won't take as much uh, it won't take 15 years. Hopefully we can capitalise on the new moral sensibility in Australia that the Postal Survey has brought out, brought into the light, uh, and divert that into these other issues that really need work. So what would it look like? I mean, to, again, and to each of the panellists talking to your um, areas of amazing expertise, I mean, if you could get what you wanted, um, what would that look like for the communities that you work with? So with the work that we're doing on conversion therapy, it's really complex because we're working with conservative communities who think that LGBT people are sick and can be fixed. Um, we know from our research and all the existing research that's out there that any attempt to change someone's sexuality and gender doesn't work and deeply harms people. But they don't know that. Uh, and just attacking them, just passing a law won't fix it. It's difficult work that's required to get alongside people uh, and get them to see the harm that they're doing um, uh, and work out for themselves a better way to care for LGBT people in their communities. I think my vision would be that that statistic that one in two trans people has attempted suicide at some point in their life would not look like that. Um, it would look significantly different and I think for it to look significantly different would require all of the kinds of changes to law that we talk about, all of the kinds of changes to social attitudes and, and cultural views, um, access to good quality healthcare, good experiences when they're doing that. So if that figure shifts, that would tell me that the other things are all 
are all kind of happening because they are, of course, what sits behind that figure. So my, my, yeah, my vision for the world is one where the mental health of transgender diverse people is as, as good or bad either way as everybody else's um, because that would tell me that they're having an equality of experience. And I, I mentioned that statistic um, to a friend of mine from overseas recently and they were staggered and they said, how is this not a problem that everyone is jumping up and down and protesting about? And it made me realise as, as well that, you know, it, we work in this space and you mention it so many times that in some ways you, you, it does become normalised. You get used to the statistic of it. But, you know, one in two, you know, if, if we cut this room in half and said half of the people here had attempted suicide because of the discrimination and abuse that they face from other people in the community, that would be so unacceptable. And how do you think... Um, why do you think um, that exists and we're not, you know, rioting every day about it? Why is it not that something we're doing more about? I don't think that many people know the statistic. So I, you know, every time I say it, there's there's a whole bunch of people who didn't know that and are, and are shocked by it. So I think lots of people don't know that. And then again, around those issues of kind of visibility and around, if you if you think about it, that's the community we're talking about. And and so what is the resilience of members of that community to be able to advocate? Um, that's where the importance of allies kind of comes in. So it's about making sure that people even know about this and then do they care about this and then will they do something about it, particularly given the community affected can sometimes not be in the best place to do that themselves. So, so it, again, a little sort of like conversion therapy, There's it's quite complex around going, how do you empower and build the resilience of a community, enable them to lead the solutions, us, them, I mean, to lead those lead those solutions, uh, but also we need allies and how do we educate people and like it's there's there's many many bits to it, all doable, but not a thing that happens overnight. And I think that's a challenge that we face with some of the issues that we have. In some ways, you know, when everyone shouted at those rallies, what do you want? Marriage equality. It was this, you know, really simple, clear, you know, one small legislative fix to the Marriage Act. But when we're talking about, you know, mental health issues, when we're talking about, you know, complexities of working within faith communities, which aren't homogenous, which have lots of differences and lots of nuance about how people engage with it, when we're talking about a whole range of different workplaces um, and, you know, that cultural change that you spoke about it is a lot more complex, but I'm going to throw to Will with a question that I know, picking up on Aram's theme of working together, solidarity, allies working, everyone working together. How can we do that better? How can we do it better? Yeah. Um, I think that... Uh, I'm a trade unionist, so working collectively, that's what we do, and it's hard, hard work uh, because it requires that everybody... Uh, listens to each other. It requires that you agree about how you're going to make decisions together. It requires um, that you at times put aside your own priorities to do support of others. Um, and that always has to be done in a really kind of – it's got to be reciprocal. Like it, it, everyone's got to know in the room that everyone's being heard, that everyone's priorities are in the mix, but that when we make a decision about something that we kind of go in and we combine to, to kind of all do that thing together. And I think that's a challenge in our communities because I don't think the things that we want and need are the same. Um, I think that, and they're all valid. It's all a valid experience. It's fine. It's as a lesbian, I can say that my, in fact, the discrimination I experience um, at work is more related to being a woman than it is to being a lesbian. So that's my experience of work. The experience of a trans person at work is very different because it's tied in with an identity that's you know there's so much at play in there, which is also about that kind of still being the other, I think you're right, visibility and that kind of thing. I think that solidarity is when we all go into a room and we all talk and listen and then we find the the moments where we say, I'm going to set my thing aside now because this thing's really important and we're going to do this thing. That's what we're going to do for a while and that's okay. It doesn't mean that my thing's not going to be dealt with. It just means that right now this is the thing. One in two trans people are attempting suicide that's a thing. So let's all just go, okay, this other stuff, let's put that aside. Collective community working together to fix things is really hard work and I don't know that our communities are 
experienced at it and I don't know that we do it necessarily that well. Yeah, that would be my the, reflection. I was in the US a, a couple of years ago, so it was early in like Trump had just arrived and it was interesting talking to some of the advocacy groups there where they were doing that showing up for each other. So I went to the Sierra Club, who's a very, very old environmentalist group, and they were saying, we turn out now when Planned Parenthood is under attack um, and vice versa. We know that Planned Parenthood will turn out when there's an environmental issue that's at stake and it is that showing up for each other's things and treating them just as importantly as your own issue because it's understanding that the thing are the things, the issues are all connected and that strength comes from, from kind of putting that all together. And so I think the, the US for a range of reasons is sometimes a bit better at that or if they've had to and I think, yeah, there's some space for us to, yeah. to practice that, I think, um, as, as LGBTI folks and our allies turning up for, for Aboriginal people who are still fighting for recognition in ways that um, they shouldn't still be talking about and that, that real reciprocal kind of thing I think is important. We say we have a statement of solidarity that we use at Trades Hall and the two lines that always I go back to are our diversity is our strength, our solidarity is our power. And it's about therefore acknowledging the diversity that we have, taking strength from that, listening, but understanding that what you then do with that is solidarity is where the power comes to actually make change. And I just have two more questions for the panellists and then I'm going to throw to the audience. So if you just want to start thinking about questions for the panellists now, you'll have your chance to speak soon. I'm sure you have lots of questions. Um, but before we move on, I just want to follow up from that. We're talking about beyond marriage equality, but I think there's also lots of learnings from the marriage equality campaign and why it was successful, that you had this bringing together of unusual suspects, that you had a lot of coordination and you had, for the first time, for a long time, lots of disparate um, elements of the progressive community all saying the same thing. So what other lessons do we, can we learn moving forward for the other issues we're advocating for? Oh, well, I'm going to say one of the reasons why it worked so well. There are two kinds of campaigns. There's proactive campaigns where you seek, you identify a change you want to see and you work towards the change. And then there's reactive um, campaigns where somebody else does something to you and you've got to respond really quickly and you've got to get out and do it. Reactive campaigns are generally easier. People find more common ground in a reactive campaign because they understand the urgency and they understand the need to stand in solidarity. And they think through what the strategy is that's going to get them through that, that reactive campaign. So in a sense, if you, I think about marriage equality as the phase that got us to the postal survey and the postal survey bit. And actually the phase that got us to the postal survey wasn't always as coordinated and clean and everybody on the same, singing from the same page um, because it was a proactive campaign seeking to make a positive change. The postal survey campaign was much more all of those people coming together because we you have to at that moment, right, because you've got a deadline. You've got a limited window of opportunity and so at this moment we're going to – that three quarters of the stuff that we generally argue about, we're just going to put that aside for a second and do this, this thing. So I think that – I suppose that's why I'd say that's one of the, that's my read of why at the end there it it operated. There was a lot of goodwill from a lot of people who sometimes sit in rooms and don't express that goodwill in quite as positive a way as that. Any comments? Well, another thing that, and this will be my last question. So. Audience members, get ready to ask your questions as well. But another thing that's um, often spoken about is how the progressive movement often sounds like there's hundreds of different issues that we're working on. And that's true as well for the LGBTIQ plus community, that you know, it sounds like there's 20 different things that you're working on, whereas if you're opposing a change, if you're on the no campaign, it doesn't really matter what the issue is. You just say, no change, change is bad. Right? So how do we deal with people thinking, oh, well, it just seems like there's a lot of complicated stuff going on here and there's 50 different things I have to keep track of. It's just all too much. How do we um, deal with and grapple with that? I really, want, I really want to capitalise. I've said this a few times, but I really want to capitalise on how significant the shift uh, in discussion of values and beliefs in Australia has been. The majority of Australians came out and said LGBT people are human and deserve all the pleasures and dangers of full citizenship. 
Um, and I kind of think we can really build on that. Uh, I think that's a massive change in public opinion. And the demonstration of it uh, is, is really, really powerful. And I think that can be used. Yes, there are lots of scrappy and messy and different forms of paper that need to be changed and different little communities that need to do some hard thinking uh, about what they believe in. Do they, is sex really that important uh, in your religious beliefs? Um, and th these, aren't issue, these aren't issues that are easy to work out, but I think the powerful demonstration that we are, fully, we are full human beings and deserve uh, dignity and respect uh, is a unifying theme that I think we should really carry forward. Yeah, I think the, the full human beings is a is a nice way of capturing all of it, really, isn't it? If we, that's, I don't know how we turn that into a really like good rallying cry. Kind of, <laughs> yeah. what, what do we, we want? want? Yeah. Lots of things. When do we want them? Whenever we can achieve them? Have you got time for this? Have you got time? I I think one of the things too is um, it's always the way. There's 30 million things that we're outraged about at any given moment. And you've got to draw energy from that, not get overwhelmed by it. You've got to draw energy from the fact that it is always going to be hard to be at the progressive end when you want change because, um, you know, just sitting still is easy. Moving forward is the hard thing. So we're always going to have that. But you've got to draw energy from other people who are doing it, from the, you know, the and the fact that, Every step of progress is amazing. Like when you actually think that kind of just sitting still is the, is the natural state to push forward, it's fantastic. When you achieve something, you just, it's amazing. It's fantastic. And also I think another gift of the postal survey, if, even though it was horrible, one of those really shit gifts in many ways, uh, but a gift of it uh, is that it, it forced everyone to talk about something at the same time and got people active. And it was like, I think for many people, it was the first time they'd yeah. ever been to a rally. It's the first time they got involved in politics. So it was an instigation. It was like a little a political education for a generation. And there are people now uh, who, who know that when they stand up and count, uh, and get their friends and talk to their families and do the work, you can make change. It was a really powerful demonstration that ordinary people can make change in society. We, we did door knocks and 90% of the people that showed up had never done anything political in their lives. They'd never protested, they'd never engaged in any campaigning before and they turned out to do something that traditionally as campaigners you would say is the hard ask of people will you go to door to door and talk about something it was extraordinary it was extraordinary that what people did and if any of those people feel like now they can do the next thing that's the hope i draw from it as well and that's a perfect segue talking about the power of bravely asking questions and putting your hand up um, does anyone have any questions for our panel members for tonight Okay, if you just wait for the microphone to come around to you. And I should say that um, ideally questions can be said in one breath and end in a question mark. Um, I'm not quite sure about my question, but it's something to do with visibility. I mean, the whole process we've been through has made visible to many people the, the whole spectrum of people in our society, people they weren't aware of. And I, I know my mother, who was 93, wore, proudly wore a rainbow um, badge and had people in a nursing home ask her about it. And her comment to me was, many of them didn't have any young people in their family and because they didn't have young people in their family, they had no idea that these people existed, really. What I'm asking is, how can we... Um, from child, early childhood onwards, have more publicity, more books, more visibility on TV, so that it is normal, it is part of our society. How can we do that? Oh, yeah, I, I think it's changing. So I, um, I was in Hares and Hyenas the other day, which most people will know is a great bookshop on Johnson Street that has had a long history in the LGBT community, and I was teasing them about the fact that the photography books they used to have with all of the very handsome men in them had all been replaced by the um, kids' books. So the kids' book section had overtaken the uh, 
uh, very non-child friendly section, um, which I think is a, is a yeah, demonstration of kind of how things are shifting. Um, I think about my niece during the, the, the postal survey and she said, oh, she saw a rainbow flag and said, they're very strongly supporting yes. And I said, they are. And do you even know what they're saying yes to? And she framed it as, well, it's about boys being able to wear dresses and girls being able to be tomboys. Um, and when I said, yeah, it's kind of about that and also about boys being able to marry boys and girls being able to marry girls. And she was like, well, yeah. And it was just not a thing for her. And my, I've got a four-year-old, he's at daycare, his best friend is a boy who sometimes is very boy and sometimes comes in a tutu and nobody cares. And so I think there is a generational shift that's happening um, and I think that will that will continue. You know, when we do surveys of younger people, many more of them identify as being something other than heterosexual and cisgender. So I think it's a, it is, it, you know, it will continue to accelerate, and we just need to make sure we keep holding that space for that to happen, and and hold back the forces that want to kind of shut all that down and say we shouldn't talk about it and we can't have those kids' books and all that sort of stuff. Do we have another question? Hi, my question is um, partly um, how best can people within the LGBT plus community help be a better ally for people at, that are part of the acronym that you're not? For example, how best can a bisexual person help with trans issues? And also, is there a difference, do you think, between how people within the queer community can help versus uh, people that are not part of the queer community be better allies? Oh, okay. Do you have thoughts? I have some <laughs> thoughts. I think you should share those thoughts. Well, you're thinking of some other thoughts. Well, I'm thinking any? of other thoughts. Yeah, oh, okay. I'm the, an I'm the question answerer. Um, sorry, the question again. Oh, that's right, how to be a good how ally. Be a good yeah, ally. yeah. I mean, I think getting educated is step one. So regardless of whether you are within the community or outside of it, knowing, knowing the issues, um, I think wherever possible, trying to find ways to enable the people who that issue affects to speak and create that space or invite people in or connect people up, if you can do that, is good. But failing that, then speaking out yourself. And you can say, this is not my experience, this isn't, you know, what I have experienced, but what I understand from other people is this is important or that is important. And I think the difference sometimes between folks who are within our LGBTI communities and outside of that is around what conversations and groups of people do you have access to or don't you? Um, it was my experience in transitioning and suddenly being part of the boys club, I had access to conversations I didn't when I was female presenting before. And so that enabled me to have conversations I couldn't have had before. And so I think it's the same, I think, whether you're inside the LGBTIQ pluses communities or outside of it, thinking about yeah, what do you, what position do I have? What access do I have to conversations? And then use that to progress conversations that otherwise wouldn't be happening in those spaces. I think that's the most useful thing that allies can do sometimes. And my thoughts? Um, we have a chant in the union movement. It goes something like this. When X is under attack, what do we do? Stand up, fight back. So when workers' rights are under attack, what do we do? We stand up, fight back. Um, that's also about solidarity, which is if you see a community being – if you see a group being attacked, then it is your job and responsibility and solidarity to put aside whatever it is that you're doing and go stand up with that. And I think that um, – that's how I understand allyship and support and certainly the concept of solidarity, which is that you give voice to, you, you give space to voices to speak, you hear what they are saying and when they are saying to you, we are under attack and we need some help, then you go do that thing. And don't be afraid to do it. Like no. get educated, don't say stupid things and don't don't speak don't speak for other people when they're there, but don't be afraid to get educated uh, and to step out step in helpfully. Mm. Next question. Um, hi, uh, thank you for sharing your views first of all. Um, my question is in two parts. Number one is, I think you touched upon that statistic. Um, according to research by Diversity Council Australia, uh, only 32% of LGBTIQ people are out at their workplaces. I am a volunteer for GLOBE, which is Gay and Lesbian Organization for Business and Enterprise. I'm their corporate engagement lead. And right now we are trying to figure out what concrete steps can be taken to address this statistic. 
uh, practical steps in workplaces. That's part one. And part two is to do with diversity and representation. So you brought up a really excellent point of Penny Wong and how role modeling can be such a powerful thing for people of color within the LGBTIQ community. But having said that, there is no mention of racism within the LGBTIQ community and how en endemic that problem is. So when we talk about looking beyond yes campaign, why are we not talking about this issue, this elephant in the room? Mm. I, I think, yeah, th thank you. To speak to the second half of that, that question, the marriage equality campaign strategically pretended they were all perfect um, and we were going to be perfect same-sex couples with uh, white picket fences, but we're just as troubled uh, as everybody else. That's what being fully human is. Um, and so there are problems with racism, there's problems with domestic violence in um, LGBT couples. Uh, but what I think the space that we have now is opened up for us to be able to start to deal with those things and start to talk about them amongst ourselves. I think, I think it's time. I think everyone knows that it's time. Did you want to? Uh, in terms of the workplace work, um, so we've done, we've been doing this thing called Pride Chats, uh, where um, it's like a kit that you can take and you can do it, and it's a structured conversation. It's about an hour, it's about what's the good experiences of work, what are the more challenging things that happen which relate to your L being LGBTIQ. If you could identify what the priorities are, and you kind of work on that. And so it's it's kind of a, a, a way to have a conversation about those issues that leads to a point where you can identify what the potential solutions might be in your workplace to do things. Um, I don't think that I'm a big believer that change, that leadership exists across every level of an organisation and that there are people who are leaders as much on the floor or, you know, in, in a group as they're people who are at the top of an organisation and that you've got to engage leadership at every level in that process to change culture so that people feel safe and included in a workplace. So we're working on how, what the like training packages that can be delivered, not just that kind of diversity training, which is for executive level, but how do we talk about these issues to workers on the ground? How do we go to, a, how do we talk to the construction workers on a site about LGBTIQ issues? Um, and how do we frame that conversation for us, which is in part a conversation about solidarity and standing shoulder to shoulder and that, like how do we frame that conversation for our people as much as for uh, people in white collar bureaucratic roles where there are HR structures that can do that. How do we do that in places, in other spaces? So that's the work that we are engaged in at the moment. How do we bring everyone along? And I think that, um, you know, that last question is a great one to mm -hmm. end the evening on as we are wrapping up to the end of the hour, which is we've discussed a few of the things that we need to work on beyond marriage equality, but there are so many other issues as well that we as a community need to tackle um, around diversity and inclusion and equality and how we fight together in solidarity for each of these things. Um, so I'm going to give the panel one last opportunity very quickly. Um, if there's one key takeaway that you want everyone here tonight to walk away with, what is your key takeaway about beyond marriage equality and what we need to do next? Uh, um, I don't know that it's beyond, but I would say uh, for all its flaws, for all the fact that we present, like the campaign was at a particular thing and it aimed for a particular thing that, you know, as a feminist lesbian of over 50 years age, who would have thought that I would ever be fighting for marriage? Like seriously, um, for all of that, we did an amazing thing as a community and we should, I think ch achieving change and achieving equality is like climbing Everest and it feels like we got somewhere that I think you've talked about this a bit, that we can't be pushed back from. Doesn't mean we've got, we, we've got to keep going, there are more things to do, but I reckon we showed what we can do when we do it right and we got to, we got to base camp and they can't ever push us back from that. And that's a beautiful thing. 
So really quickly to build on that, I think um, now that we've got we've got there, it is about building on that and saying, so who are the folks who are still yeah. further left behind? And that might be people of colour, it might be trans folks, it might be a whole range of people and saying we need to keep banding together in that same way because we're here, we probably won't backslide, but how do we get further forward? And we, we can do that if we are really conscious about doing that. And leaving no one behind. Yeah. Mm. And one of the things that I'm optimistic about, um, the campaign was super hard for so many of us. Uh, and so many people are still just like I was here last night at a book launch, going postal, documenting um, writings that from by queer people during the campaign, and it felt like it was a room full of people just sitting there who were actually just open wounds, uh, remembering all the traumas of the campaign. But what I also saw was people supporting each other. People like we we got a political education. Lots of people, lots of people got a political education for the first time, but we also got an education about looking after each other. Uh, and I think that's something that's really something to value and to maintain as we go into the future. Okay, well, I can't end it any better than that. Can you please join me in thanking our wonderful panellists for this evening? Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world. 